We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. If my voice sounds different this week, <laughs> it is because I have entered my smelly cat era and mm-hmm. am dealing with the effects of a sinus infection, which... I have to get at least twice a year. It's like, at this point, become a thing. Yeah, summer sickness is a thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, enough about me and my fun nasal issues. <laughs> Let's talk about stuff. This week, we will be discussing the children of Lule Laco. Ooh. And I'm going to do my best to pronounce all these things, but everybody knows how bad I am at uh, other <laughs> So give me some grace, please. (laughs) Information was pulled from the following sources. A 2023 Smithsonian Magazine article by Sarah Kuta. 2021 All That's Interesting article by Bernadette Giacomazzo. 2016 Internet Archaeology 42 article by Andrew Wilson. 2016 Penn Museum Expedition Magazine article by Johan Reinhardt. 2015 Biomed Research International article by Maria Constanza Ceruti. 2013 Archaeology Magazine article by Andrew S. Wilson. 2013 BBC News article by Rebecca Morel or Morelli. 2013 Live Science article by Joseph Castro. 2013 National Geographic article by Brian Handwerk. 2013 Nature World News article by Isabel Alface. 2013 NBC News article by John Roach, 2013 Science Magazine article, 2013 USA Today article by Melody Brumble, 2012 Global Press Journal article by Yvonne Genot Lanes, Lanes, one of those, 2007 Metro <laughs> UK article, 1999 Washington Post article by Kathy Sawyer, Smithsonian Institution National Museum of Natural History Global Volcanism Program article and Wikipedia. Dang. You were thorough this week. I was thorough. And thank you to Carrie Ann for her research assistance and for Mm -hmm. looking up all of the source materials for me so I can just dive in and read stuff and start writing. So it is appreciated. Thank you, Carrie Ann. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. We wouldn't be here without support from listeners like you. If you're interested in supporting us financially, you can leave a one-time or monthly donation over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page. Links are in the show notes. And we make a point of reaching out to send you a thank you note and stickers to show our appreciation. Want to show your support in a more concrete way? Pick up some Yield Crime merch over at our Tee Public shop. We shout out whenever there is a sale each month, and we work to make sure we're creating new designs and changing it up whenever possible. And hey, thanks for listening. Nicknamed Juanita, La Doncella, Inca Ice Maiden, and Lady of Ampato, the Lulelaco Maiden and two other small children were discovered on March 16, 1999, high in the Andes Mountains in present-day Peru, atop a 20,000-foot volcano bearing the same name. Oh. Lulilaco, which is located on the border of Chile and Argentina, is Mm -hmm. a stratovolcano, which means it's built up from alternating layers of lava and ash and Mm -hmm. is the world's highest historically active volcano with its last eruption taking place in 1877. Okay. So not... Too terribly long ago. No. It sits at an elevation of 6,739 meters or 22,110 feet. Okay. The teenage Inca girl is believed to be a victim of ritualistic sacrifice 
over 500 years ago in the Empato volcano northwest of Requipa. Archaeologists believe that she was sacrificed as part of the Inca ritual of Capacocha. According to Aaron Blackmore from National Geographic, quote, Capacocha mostly involved the sacrifice of children and animals who were offered to the gods in response to natural disasters to consolidate state power in far-flung provinces of the Inca Empire or simply to please the deities, end quote. As noted in her Biomed Research International article, Maria states, quote, an Inca Capacocha ceremony involved the movement of sacrificial victims along with various ceremonial goods from the peripheral communities of the conquered provinces towards the centrally located capital city of Cusco. After being ritually transformed into Inca-style offerings in the capital city, the sons and daughters of local chiefs, as well as the chosen virgins of the sun god, were then made to travel in ritual procession to various sacred places located throughout the empire. They eventually would be sacrificed and buried at designated locations as vivid representations of the state cult to the sun god Inti, as well as an imperial homage to the local sacred sites known as wakas, end quote. So they would sacrifice the, the chief's daughter, sons and daughters too. But not like the emperor's daughter. None of the emperor's children, but other like local rulers. Um, typically the, the people that were chosen to be sacrificed came from one form of noble or elite family. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Like that's so the opposite of like, if you were to think of like the best thing to do, it would be the emperor's kids. Probably if you really wanted to please the gods and be humble, mm -hmm. but the fact that they still took noblemen's children and sacrificed mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you ever want to be a ruler? <laughs> yeah. At that point. Mm -hmm. Or like, if you are that ruler, are you making children just to make sacrifices? Like it would change your know. entire perspective on child rearing. That's super messed up. Part of the Capacocha ceremony included the burial of the sacrifices with lavish gifts, quote, such as cumbi textiles, fine pottery, and figurines made of gold, silver, and spondylus shell, end quote. In the case of the Lulelaco site, it's included, quote, more than 100 offerings comprising metal figurines, spondylus shell, fine imperial pottery, combi textiles, and feathered adornments of tropical birds, all in an excellent state of preservation, end quote. Wow. Yeah, isn't, isn't like volcanic ash and that stuff like really good at preserving mm -hmm. things inside them? Like once you get the ash off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. That's so crazy. In ancient South America, human sacrifices have been depicted as far back as 100 to 700 CE on moche pottery and was common among such cultures as the Mayans, Olmecs, Aztecs, and the Teotihuacan cultures. The practice, which for the Incas took place on mountains, according to artistic representations, was related to agricultural fertility rights and water management. It wasn't until eight centuries later under the Inca civilization that these types of ritualistic killings would increase. Interesting that they increased it. Because, yeah, yeah norm typically it kind of would just gradually go out of style. Mm -hmm. The Incan civilization first appeared in 1100 CE. From 1438 to 1532, the Incas expanded their empire from the capital city of Cusco until it occupied a 2,500-mile stretch along the Pacific coast of South America, from Colombia to central Chile. Okay. The Incas constructed, quote, stone structures on nearly 100 mountains, ranging from 17,000 to 22,000 feet, or on average, 6,700 meters. And they did this in an area spanning 2,000 miles in the Andes, end quote. Wow. They were thorough. You got to factor in that this is like very 
oxygen scarce areas where like mm-hmm. it's the air is super thin. Most people get like air sickness from being that high yeah. up, let alone being able to do construction work at right. the top of these mountains. So like archaeologists and historians are like baffled by how they were able to do this and do it on a hundred mountains. Right. Like how many people died? How many slaves died building this kind yeah. of thing? But you also have to think too, for them being in that area, they also might have just genetically been better equipped to withstand that kind of environment too. If That's true. Like they've had generations and generations of people living in that environment. Your bodies over time eventually start making micro changes to yep. adapt better. That's true. The maiden isn't the only Inca sacrifice to be discovered in the Andes. Researchers have found the remains of over a dozen people on the summits of Quijar, Aquancawa, Ampato, El Plomo, Chani, Misti, and Chusha summits. Hmm. Human sacrifices were done to celebrate life events of the emperor. These include when a new Inca ruler is crowned, which could include up to 200 children being sacrificed. Oh my god. Or when the emperor is gifted with the birth of a son. So 200 children would die because one child was born. Cool. Well, I like that. Man. They didn't say how many were sacrificed I when know. the son was born, but but yeah, like it seems like a weird thing to do. Let's celebrate one birth with the death of several others. Yeah. Other events could be as common as returning victorious from battle, during which any war prisoners captured would be sacrificed to the sun god Inti as thanks for a successful campaign. I mean, that makes the most sense. Out of all the sacrifices, yep. sacrificing enemies mm-hmm. after a battle, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> most civilizations would probably do that in yeah. general. And it wasn't just life events that involved human sacrifice death events were just as important. The Incas would practice necropompa, or the ritualistic killing of wives and servants, when an emperor has passed on, so he has them waiting for him in the afterlife. Kind of like Sati from last week, but only without the burning. But, like, how painful or awful is the ritualistic killing, too, you know? Oh, well, we'll go into it, what the different options were. Mm. Historians noted that when the Inca emperor Huayna Copac passed away, 1,000 people were sacrificed, although that number could be over 4,000. Why? Like, oh, the emperor needs an, a village in the afterlife? No, he doesn't. No, he does not. Well, and many that were sacrificed volunteered to do so, to be able to serve their ruler in the afterlife. No, you don't need to be a part of that afterlife village. He's cool. He can just chill out and wait for you guys. He can wait for you. He can boss around a couple spirits in the meantime. Sacrifices were also made following natural disasters, such as earthquakes, epidemics, droughts, and volcanic eruptions. The belief was that these disasters were the result of improperly performed sacred rituals, and only the offering of a human life could reset the imbalance. I feel so awful for the first time that that happened successfully that caused this chain of events to just never stop. So it was like, this natural disaster happened because we need to atone for our sins or we need to atone Mm -hmm. for something that we did. So now we need to make this sacrifice in order to like bring the scales back to balance. And that could just be anything too, you know, because of course... Weather changes would link up to like when you are planting crops and when you're harvesting because that's when pressures change and it's pretty typical. So I can't imagine how many like impromptu sacrifices they would have to depending on droughts and the bloody farmer's almanac. (laughs) When a sacred place was constructed, human sacrifices would be used to consecrate it, such as when the Temple of the Sun was built in Cusco. Prior to its construction, several children that had been sent by local rulers were buried alive in the sanctuary. 
and a 10-year-old girl was sacrificed and buried on a summit near her village to ensure an irrigation canal that was being built would be completed without issue. That's so awful. Like those, if you were to do like a live burial, a live burial, it should have been an adult at the very least, like somebody who would really understand the gravity of what is happening. Like burying children alive is horrific. I think that's the worst Hmm. thing I've heard thus far. Because those kids have no idea. And we will later on explain why it's children and a little bit more about what is involved in the live burials so that they just kind of go along with it. So we'll get there. Mm. It's not great. So the three children we'll be discussing today, of which the maiden was one, were found in 1999, as I mentioned, by Johann Reinhard at an elevation of 6,715 meters, or just 24 meters from the summit of this volcano, and included a boy and a girl who were both around four to five years old. (laughs) And it's believed that the young boy and girl, who have been dubbed Lulilaco boy and lightning girl, were possibly the maiden's attendants. So they were supposed to, like, assist her in the afterlife. The Egyptians did this a lot, too, didn't they? Yep. I bet you the Europeans did it, too, at some point. Like the Vikings and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Oh, yeah, the Vikings did it. Yeah, for sure. Yohan is a veteran mountain explorer. And in addition to the Lulilaco children, he's discovered 16 other Inca mummies. The expedition in which the children were found was sponsored by the National Geographic Society. And people like you. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for buying all those magazines. And the 14-person team spent a month searching a lower peak before they started following a trail of quote-unquote fill dirt that was a clear indication of human activity. So, like, Hmm. you know when you you walk on, like, sand and things like shit? It's like that. It's, like, clearly different. And there's no animals at the summit, so it wouldn't have been... I I can't imagine the people on that team, like, you were talking about breathing and stuff, that would have been really difficult for them because they're not native to that. And spending a month, like, a month and a half, that's that would be really, really hard on your body. Speaking of that, the team had to deal with difficult conditions such as strong winds and temps that plummeted as low as 40 degrees Celsius below zero. That's also the same as 40 degrees below zero in Fahrenheit. And we've experienced that before in Minnesota. So yeah, I know how cold that is. Holy smokes. The discovery of a small llama figurine carved out of a rare seashell was the clue they were looking for, that they were close to the site. Oh my god, how excited. I I probably would have cried at the sight of a seashell at that point. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I know. (laughs) The children would be found in a small chamber located 1.5 meters under the summit. So the site is buried. Interesting. The community that the children belonged to would have likely viewed the maiden's selection as a sacrifice to be a great honor. I bet. And after analyzing the ash that was found near her mummified remains, archaeologists hypothesized that she was sacrificed following a volcanic eruption. Okay, so she was one of the environmental, please stop, please make it stop. She and the young boy and girl would have been selected for their beauty and perfection. Both girls were dressed in fitted tunics, sporting several long braids in their hair. The boy was buried with a large headdress made from white feathers. So Mm. they all kind of had... Like almost just like event gear, like really beautiful. Like it wasn't cornrows, but it was like small, mini small braids like that. Like very Mm -hmm. thin small braids all over their hair. That's cool. Mm -hmm. When she was found, the maiden's colorful alpaca wool robes, dark hair, teeth, and fingernails were all well-preserved. All three children are considered some of the best preserved mummies in the world, quote, Mm -hmm. with blood still visible in their hearts and their lungs are still inflated, end quote. That's insane. It makes sense 
with if you think about the environment that they're buried in mm-hmm. like it would kind of be the perfect like kind of like pseudo freezer almost mm-hmm. kind of just yep. by the way it's buried in its location mm-hmm. and that's where we preserve bodies <laughs> so it all makes sense According to forensic and archaeological expert Andrew Wilson from the University of Bradford, UK, in regards to the maiden, quote, she looks almost as if she's just fallen asleep, end quote. Yeah. I was wondering if if they just drugged the heck out of them and they did fall asleep and it was negative 40 degrees that killed them swiftly. Because if they're just wearing a tunic, like Mm -hmm. they're not covering them up. Your body would go into shock pretty quick, I would think. Just natural. Well, you don't need a cloak in the afterlife. No, you don't. Especially with the sun god. Johan noted, quote, Several conditions contribute to the excellent preservation of the bodies. Most important is the continuous below-freezing temperatures found at the high altitudes of Andean peaks. Scientists have noted that some humidity is necessary for the preservation of the body. The total absence of moisture causes shrinkage and organic materials become brittle due to water loss. Mm. If volcanic ash surrounds the mummies, such as has occurred in some cases in the Andes, this also helps to inhibit the growth of bacteria while maintaining moisture, and the rapid burial and freezing of the soil can result in a vapor barrier being created, further impeding decomposition. This unique combination of factors makes the Andean summits excellent places for their preservation of organic material, such as on Lulelaco, the volcano with the world's highest archaeological site, end quote. Mm-hmm. I'd be really curious to, like, if you could ever go back and understand, I'd be curious to know why, because you would assume that they they knew, they chose those spots because they be preserved in that way so like what's the significance in the sacrifices remaining pretty much the same like almost frozen in time in death like what does that mean for the afterlife everybody else just toss in the dirt or you burn yeah it's my understanding that they chose the tops of the mountains because it was the closest to the sun god Mm -hmm. it'd be very easy for him to just come and grab the sacrifice and it was supposed to be that they it's almost like they're falling asleep and like going through whatever the veil is to the realm of the gods astrally projecting to the next life so i don't know if they were aware that the bodies would be preserved based off where they were buried they probably had no idea but that's just That's where they buried them because that was the closest you could possibly get to the sun god. Yeah. Do you know if, is, is there any sort of like evidence that they would visit these sites after they would bury them or would it be kind of just a one time, here you go. And now it's, it's a sacred place that we can't visit again. I think it was just like, we're going to leave them here and then leave because you can't withstand negative 40. <laughs> well, and they had like a hundred sites that they had created over time. So I'm pretty sure they just would travel to these different summits and make these different sites kind of depending on what the occasion was or what the disaster mm-hmm. was that they were making these sacrifices to atone for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it does make more sense that it would be a one-time thing because you would assume if they would maintain the sites or visit them more than once that there would be fewer sites with greater amounts of people. Yeah. Like a temple with like a bunch of sacrifices versus the one. Okay. Huh. That's just, I want to know more about like what they believe in the afterlife and stuff. The maiden herself was described as, quote, about 15 years old at the time of her sacrifice. Mm. Her body was placed in the tomb facing northeast and was covered with two brown outer mantles. A feathered headdress was placed on her head and an exquisite combi tunic on her shoulder outside of the funerary bundle. Her hair was combed in numerous intricately woven braids. Her offering assemblage also included textile bags and belts, 
gold and silver figurines and various ceramic items, end quote. NBC News noted, quote, the ice maiden was inside a tomb structure, surrounded by offerings from the four corners of the Inca Empire, such as seashells, bird feathers, coca, and corn. Her head is bowed as if she fell asleep, sedated, and succumbed to the biting cold and thin air as is inevitable at such altitude, end quote. Since 1999, researchers have been studying the maiden's remains to learn more about her and what her life was like. They believe she was between 13 and 15 when she was sacrificed, passing away between the years of 1440 and 1450 CE at the height of the Incan Empire. It's so crazy. She was around 4 feet 6 inches tall and weighed around 77 pounds or 5 and a half stone. So she was just a healthy teenage girl. Tests were conducted by George Mason University, the University of Bradford, UK, and the Laboratory of Biological Anthropology at the University of Copenhagen on the long braided hair of the maiden, and the results noted that her diet had changed from mainly potatoes to more maize and animal protein, such as dried llama meat, in the final year of her life, and that she had been heavily sedated at the time of her death. Okay. It makes me feel just a little bit better about the live burials, but not a lot. Yeah. It sounds like they had a really good last year of their life, though, if they were chosen. So that means that they were chosen way in advance. So Science Magazine noted, quote, Key metabolite levels measured in the maiden's hair suggest that her coca use peaked six months before she died while her alcohol consumption skyrocketed in her final weeks. The boy mm. and the girl also ingested the two drugs, but in much smaller amounts, end quote. Yeah. And due to the length of her hair, it offered more than two years' worth of data, with the starkest changes taking place a year before her death. That's crazy. And unlike what you may think, the children that were chosen to be sacrificed were often the offspring of nobles and local rulers, as we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. They would have been sent to reinforce their political ties with the emperor. They would have lived a high-status life, and the coca leaf they regularly ingested contains cocaine. So, mm -hmm. drugs. Quote, particularly attractive or gifted women were chosen. The Incas actually had someone who went out to find these young women, and they were taken from their families, end quote. That's horrific. Could you imagine if that was your job? Mm -hmm. Just like going out and picking sacrifices? That's, yeah. And you would do it so passionately, too, because you would think that whoever's doing it truly believes that, like, their choices matter and that mm -hmm. they have to find the perfect ones or the volcano will destroy their village or they won't have any crops that yep. year or there'll be a flood or there'll be a drought just the gravity of it because this is what they truly believe in the case of lule Laco, she was from a peasant family and as the eldest of the three sacrifices regularly ingested chicha or corn beer versus the younger children yeah both substances so the coca leaves Cocaine. and the chicha were reserved primarily for the elite of Inca society, but it's believed that the alcohol, the chicha, had been used as a sort of sedative to impair the maidens and the other children's shivering reflex, which would have hastened their deaths via exposure. Radiological scans of the maiden revealed that she still had coca leaves in her mouth when she died. So she kind of had it like, you know how people put Almost like, like, a, like a chew. Yeah, mm -hmm. like she had it in her cheek. Wow. Life leading up to their sacrifice would have likely started in the Inca capital of Cusco, Peru, where the maiden and her attendants would have lived, quote, under the guardianship of priestesses, end quote, where she passed time by brewing chicha and weaving textiles. I wonder if, if some of the textiles she had were ones that she made. Probably. Probably. Mm-hmm. A ceremony would have been held about six months prior to her sacrifice that involved a ritualistic hair cutting. This ceremony coincides with the spike in coca consumption that was detected in her hair samples. As noted by Science Magazine, the consumption of both coca and chicha dramatically increased over the weeks leading up to their deaths, 
likely as they traveled from Cusco to the volcano, where they would have stopped throughout their journey on a regular basis for ceremonies. Yep. And probably to the different villages that we're all contributing to. So it was probably just a six-month pilgrimage party. Essentially, yeah. Celebratory. Their pilgrimage, which would see them joined by Inca priests, would have involved them walking for several months until finally reaching the Lululaco volcano. The journey would have been 1,388 kilometers or 862 miles. And you got to think, too, there, there must have been a point with these three that they would have had to assist them at some point getting up the mountain because they're being drugged heavily, yeah. like with increased amounts, the closer they get. So like climbing up a mountain <laughs> yep. while on cocaine and being drunk would be yeah. so difficult. So you would have yep. to think that they would have some sort of method to help them get up there. Researchers are divided on the maiden's alcohol consumption during this time. It is possible that as she started drinking the corn beer over the course of the months leading up to her death, she had just developed a taste for it and either enjoyed drinking it, had a drinking problem, or just found the effects of drinking it soothing. It's hard to say. Yeah. Well, and honestly, all of them are valid, too. If yeah. you're, you spent the last six months of your life knowing that this was going to happen and living like the best possible life potentially like you've mm -hmm. ever had and you're just finally experiencing life and you don't want it to stop yet so you would or you would be petrified of your impending death then yeah I would want to be numb a yeah. little bit because at 15 you know what's happening dr emma brown from the university of bradford noted quote in the case of the maiden there is no sign of violence she is incredibly well looked after she has a good layer of fat. She has beautifully groomed hair and beautiful clothes, end quote. Researchers believe that the Inca rulers wanted the sacrifice to be known throughout the empire, which was expanding further to the south at the time of the maiden's death. The Lulilaco volcano itself is located in the southern section of the empire. So they would have traveled the length of the empire to get there. Wow. And that would have been a big deal, too, because... It would have been the first time these villages would have experienced that kind of event, the newly conquered. <laughs> what a way to get introduced to your new leaders. <laughs> Look at these three pretty kids that we're about to sacrifice. Drink. Be merry. Mm -hmm. According to a paper by Maria Constanza Ceruti, in regards to the little boy and girl, quote, the Lulelaco boy, who was, she says seven years old, but you know, was wearing a red tunic, leather moccasins, fur anklets, a silver bracelet, and a sling wrapped around his head, with his forehead adorned with white feathers. Two figurines were found, one representing a man and the other a llama, which had been placed on the ground close to the body. An arribalo, or an, an Inca ceramic vessel, that had contained chicha, or the Andean corn yeah, beverage, was recovered in the fill of the tomb, as well as a spondylus seashell. The body of a six-year-old female had apparently been hit by lightning after she had been buried in the tomb. She was wearing a sleeveless dress and a shawl, both kept in place with metal pins, moccasins on her feet, and a metal plaque on her forehead. Textile and uh. ceramic items, as well as metal figurines, were placed around her body on the bottom of the tomb. End quote. Did it hit her the metal part on her skull mm -hmm. oh my god there's a reason she's called lightning girl yeah they just they really created quite the conduit with all the metal pieces mm -hmm. carefully placed around her the washington post noted the following of the site quote the site harbored an unusually rich collection of undisturbed incan treasures laid out presumably to appease the mountain gods the trove included about three dozen gold, silver, and shell statues, half of them clothed, as well as bundles of ornate textiles, moccasins, and pottery, some still containing food. Found in such unusual plentitude, 
The artifacts could greatly enhance understanding of the enigmatic Incan Empire, and particularly its mountain worship, according to independent experts. End quote. That's okay. So crazy. Now, you were curious to know why it was children. The reason that children were selected to be the messengers to the gods was likely due to their purity, hmm. making them fitting mediators between the Incas and the deities they worshipped. Parents of the sacrificial children were to turn over their children willingly for these ceremonies and to view it as a great social honor to have their offspring selected to perform this, quote, act of pious devotion, end quote. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't. I have a really hard time with fear in religion in general. I know that it goes hand in hand with all religions, essentially. Yeah. There is a there is an element of fear and everything, but well, and the way we have grown, that is not part of our culture. If that mm-hmm. was part of our culture and that was just a known thing that could happen, oh yeah, of course I could see how it would be viewed as this huge honor if that's just how what your cult your culture was, like right. Well, and then you you have to wonder too. Would you view it? Like, in terms of the maiden girl, she was from a really poor family, maybe even would have lived her life in really harsh conditions. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this the best way for your kids to live before they die too? You know, like, maybe is this the best option in a really horrific way? Because who knows if like the families the families would benefit a little bit too. You would have to imagine that they would at least benefit initially, like briefly where they could have more than just potatoes or maybe they get, you know, like. I'm sure they get something, but I don't know what they would have gotten. It probably wouldn't be a lot, but you know. Yeah, because it typically was from other military, or not military, other noble families. So I don't know what the exchange would have been for a peasant child. I don't know. According to ethno-historical sources, boys that were chosen tended to be between the ages of 4 and 10, whereas girls would be taken from their homes prior to hitting puberty before being raised in special houses under the care of religious women, who would teach them how to weave and brew corn beer. At the time they reached the age of 14, they would be taken to either become secondary wives for nobles, become consecrated to serve as priestesses, or be chosen for sacrifice. Yeah. Johan noted that the girls that were found tended to be older than the boys that were sacrificed, as they would have been kept as virgins, whereas mm-hmm. there was no real equivalent for maintaining the virginity of young boys. So okay. I don't know if it was just like a known thing that they would be for. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Well, but- yeah, it kind of sounds like they have they have just one side of like I am trying to relate this to Catholicism a little bit like. Nuns and priests. So, like, it sounds like they had like a monastery or like a nunnery. Is that what you call it? I don't know. (laughs) But it sounds like they had that part. They just didn't have a similar area for like monks or priests in that way. It doesn't sound like they they had a, a school or they didn't use it for this purpose. Yeah, they didn't have like a seminary type of situation where... Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I wonder why, though. I wonder what... Do you know if the Incan society was more matriarchal overall? I have no idea. I know very little about it. They, they always choose super talented, bright women. Like, why are you killing all the bright, beautiful women <laughs> in the village? Like, what's I don't the- know. Scientists conducted a CT scan of the maiden's mummy at the Catholic University of Salta, noting that her cause of death, that can't be right, because it says her cause of death was a fatal blow to the head. I don't think, no, she didn't have a blow to the head. That must be wrong. It might be a different one. However, I, know, I have heard of Incan ones where they yeah. did not come out. Either way, this lines up with the traditional methods that would be used during the Capacocha ceremonies with the methods of death being either strangulation, a blow to the head, suffocation, or being buried alive. The Inca believed that the deities would prefer a messenger that was quote-unquote whole, as opposed to one whose body was desecrated. 
aka yeah. the blood of the head. Which is why they chose to bury the children alive more often than not. Yes. In the case of the young boy, it's believed that he died via suffocation. His clothes mm-hmm. were covered in vomit that was stained red due to acciote, a hallucinogenic drug that was also found in his stomach in recent feces that stained his clothes. The suffocation was mm-hmm. likely due to him being wound tightly in a textile wrap that crushed his ribs and dislocated his pelvis. Oh, God. So I don't know if he... If they crushed his ribs, yeah, he'd throw up. Like, that would have been a natural bodily consequence to being crushed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he also had, like, diarrhea all over his clothes, too. Yeah. He sounds like he had a really miserable death. CT scans of the maiden unveiled that she had developed a sinus and chest infection prior to their climb to the summit of the shrine. That makes sense given the temperatures and conditions. And compared to other human sacrifices that were bloody public displays, the Inca sacrifices were performed by priests and the summits of mountains were chosen so that the mountain deity could actively take the lives of their victims via low temperatures and extreme atmospheric conditions. Strangulation and blows to the head were only used as a last resort if death by exposure took too long or if the sacrifice resisted. Yeah. A sculptor and archaeologist from Sweden named Oscar Nielsen, who specializes in facial reconstruction, used the information that had been collected to help him envision what she may have looked like when she was still alive. He spent 400 hours carefully reconstructing her face. Upon the unveiling of her reconstructed bust, archaeologist Johan Reinhard, who had been part of the team that discovered her in 1999, stated, mm-hmm. quote, seeing her face like when she was alive it's a different experience because it seems so real, end quote. Today, all three of the children of Lule Laco are housed in Salta, Argentina, in the Museum of High Altitude, and have been on display there since 2007. On June 20th, 2001, Argentina's National Commission of Museums, Monuments, and Historic Places formally recognized them as National Historic Property of Argentina. That makes sense. The fact that they are on display has caused a bit of controversy amongst the local indigenous communities who wish to have their remains returned to them so they can honor them with a proper burial. I'm a, I was honestly wondering and a little shocked that they were able to remove them. You know, like, I know that when they find these sites, they do typically take it for analysis and stuff. But when it comes to, like, this sacred burial... Mm-hmm. Like, I I would have a problem removing it because that's what they believe. Not only this, but the exhibition of corpses has also caused a bit of a stir given its polarizing views. The scientific community also had concerns that the bodies will deteriorate under the constant exposure to artificial lighting. Yeah. I mean, they were in perfect condition where they were mm-hmm. for 500 years. Yeah. Yeah. Rogelio Quanuco, I apologize because I know I said that wrong, who as of 2021 was the leader of the Indigenous Association of Argentina, or ERA, noted that indigenous cultures in the area forbid the exhumation. He maintains that displaying them in the museum makes them appear, quote, as if in a circus, end quote. I can respect that very much so. Because, I mean, again, not to hate on... National Geographic and Johan, but it's uh, another (laughs) European group messing with indigenous people (laughs) on their own land and taking things. It's hard. Like you want to learn, you want to learn and you want to know more and you want to experience history in that way. But at the same time, there is something to be said about respecting a culture and listening to the indigenous people and respecting them you can negotiate and take things and work with them and it kind of sounds like they were never really listened to whether that was something the national geographic was aware of or took care of or not or ignored i mean you know you have this problem everywhere yeah with historical sites and it'd be different if they took their remains to like study them 
Like, mm-hmm. I understand the studying yeah. of, like, because you want to learn. You want to know. Mm-hmm. And they have learned a ton a about the Incan society as a result of doing these tests on these yeah. mummies. But at the same time, it's like, if you've exhausted all of your research, put them back. Yes. Like, Do the right thing. Because it was a sacred I mean, site. Like it's it's something where like you can recreate it. Like you can recreate you can create yes. Well the bust. The bust. Yeah. You you've already done re- recreations of, of things and mm-hmm. you know you have the resources, you know you have the money, you know you have the tools. Mm-hmm. Like if the indigenous people are asking you to return what's theirs, you should return what's theirs. And like, yeah. you know, because even even if we don't believe in sun gods, the indigenous people still might. And yeah. like, you're not respecting anything at that point. Yeah. Like to me, you're are you're the problem the second they tell you they ask you not to. Well, and it's like they were discovered in 1999. We are now 20 years over 20 years past that. Mm-hmm. Like. Science has come a long way, but at the same time, how many more tests do you need to do on these three individuals that have been deceased for over 500 years at this point? And and please, you already have the samples you need to continue whatever testing you were about to do. You don't need the entire bodies. You don't need Mm -hmm. everything. I'm sure you've already taken tiny bits of hair, Mm -hmm. eyelashes, skin, whatever you did. You have enough. I think you should put them back. I think you should honor yes. the locals' requests to return them to their proper burial site. I don't think it's okay to put them on display like that, knowing that these are people. It's a different thing to go and see like a death mask of somebody right. versus seeing their actual head. You know what I mean? Like Those are two different things. Even like the body museum too, where you do see like somebody's spine or something like that, that person or that family willingly donated yes. that body. Yes. You can't you can't go and ask these people if you can display their bodies. And the people that you would ask said no. Yeah. They're like, no, we don't want you to do this. And they're continuing to ask you. Mm-hmm to return it like yeah it's because we have the capability of putting them right back exactly the way they were so that they can stay preserved in their natural Mm -hmm. form the way Mm -hmm. it was intended the first time to just do the right thing anyway that's the (laughs) children of lululaco If you love the show, the best way to support us is to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, CastBox, Podcast Addict, and or Audible. Links to all of these are in our show notes, or if you're already listening on one of these platforms, you know what to do. Oh, and while you're at it, shoot us a question you'd like to hear us answer on the pod. We'll give you a special shout out and address your burning questions all at the same time. The weirder, the better. Submit them via link in our show notes or shoot them to us in our DMs. This week's podcast plug is the J Squared Horror Podcast. Two guys hanging out and inviting you to join the conversation about everything horror, bringing you new content every week. They're part of the Darkcast Network, and we will have a link to their show in the show notes. Nice. And Carrie Ann would like to know, would you rather be trapped in a car with two angry skunks or the smelliest cheese in the world? Trapped in a car with the smelliest cheese in the world. Mm-hmm. So, so you're trapped in a car, and you either have two angry skunks in there or the smelliest cheese in the world. Oh, the skunks! Because the skunks will eventually tire out, and and their glands will, you know, run out of juice. <laughs> and maybe I can calm them down and like hang out with them later. Whereas the cheese will just never stop. There's a potential ending to the to the skunks. There's not a potential ending to the cheese. That's fair. And I feel like there's probably better versions, better cleaners that can get a skunk smell, a pheromone smell out better than a super stinky baked in cheese smell. See, and I was thinking the opposite. I was thinking, what if the skunk juice is like all over 
like saturated in the upholstery of your vehicle. Like you'd have to. Well, then you shouldn't have gotten upholstery in the first place. You should have gotten leather. Peasant. Get out of here. Get out of here, loser. Well, considering I have fabric in my car, I don't have leather. (laughs) I'm going to go with cheese because. We have have fabric too, actually. (laughs) God, you're such a dick. Peasant. I know. Peasant. Yeah. I I would go with cheese. Leather's not in my budget. Just because I feel like eventually you can clean the cheese smell out. But unless you want to wash your entire interior in like tomato sauce and then wash it again, I think it'd be easier to get the cheese smell out. Yeah. Agree to disagree. Okay. I I yeah. also just would love two little skunk babies mm. that I could weaponize. Nah, I'm good. And love. I'm good. We'd love to hear from you, and there's a couple of ways you can reach out to us. You can email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com, where you can send us story ideas, share any spooky stories you may have, fun gifts, or even just to say hello. You can also reach out to us via snail mail. Remember mail? Our mailing address is Yield Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota 55092. Fun fact, we like to send out thank you cards with fun stickers you can't get at our shop, so it's worth the cost of a stamp. All right, what's something good you'd like to share? My partner comes home soon. He's been on training for 20 days, and we are two days away from him coming back. And I have successfully survived to this point, having three big working dogs and a cat. And the issue I have with the working dogs that I didn't anticipate was just how feral they would get not working. And no amount of attention is enough. No amount of hands or limbs touching them, petting them is ever enough. And I am at the perfect height where the two younger boys, Chief and Loki, they just walk into my kneecaps at any given point because I'm apparently a ghost and they can pass through at any point. And it's, it's honestly something where I am not joking. I, I want to get like shin guards to wear around the house or like some sort of steel plated <laughs> socks <laughs> so I, I can protect my, myself from them because I got like a really awful rope burn on my foot from chief last minute pivoting when I was trying to undo the line for when they go outside. Mm -hmm. He saw movement in the trees and gunned it and just took several layers of my skin from the top of my foot right Uh. where you bend. So it's Uh. like searing pain. (laughs) And it has been since. So they did that. And then they kept taking out my knees. And I was like, I'm not going to have my legs by the time he comes home. I'm just going to be just going to be a torso that can, you know, swing around (laughs) at this point. So I'm very ready for him to be home and for him to have all of their affection and attention and love. And then I'll just leave the house (laughs) for a minute. So I'm just, I'm very happy. They've, they've been good boys. They've, they've done a good job, but I need help in the house. It's a long time to be trapped inside with the dogs. 20 days. How about you? What's something good? I've been staying consistent with my yoga practice. Mm-hmm. I am down eight pounds since I started on July 1st. Because that also means you probably definitely have, like, inches and, in, like, just general body changes, not just yeah. the way. I bet you're gaining muscle. Thomas bought this, like, digital tape measure that syncs up with my smart scale. Oh, nice. So I can measure, like, my arms and my neck and all that fun stuff, mm-hmm. my legs. And it was interesting when he measured my shins – because my shin on my right leg, which is the one that I had the foot surgery on, is mm-hmm. a little bit smaller than my left one. And he's like, it makes sense yep. given the, the muscle atrophy that you had 
And he's like, but you'll get that up in no time. And I said, yeah, I know. But after trying to do yoga pretty much like every day, I have decided that I'm going to start taking Thursdays and Sundays off just because nice. Thursdays, they don't have any classes that I'm comfortable taking in the evenings. And I feel like Sundays, I need one day on the weekend where I can be yoga free. Yeah, I have two rest days. Mine was originally supposed to be Wednesday, but I usually end up doing Thursday, I think, as my rest day too, because I can go three days and then Thursday, you're like, yeah, I need a break. And then I take Sunday off as well. Yeah. So I think I'll do that. I have like a stepper thing that I can use on Thursdays if I want to still be active and just not be doing yoga. But mm -hmm. I figure it's good to have some some days off so I don't get burnout. Yeah. All right. Shall we? Yeah. Want to be social with us? You can see pics from this week's episode, bonus content, and funny memes on X at Ye Old Crime Pod or on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, and YouTube at Ye Old Crime Podcast. Speaking of YouTube, we have a special playlist just for our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments with our guest podcasters to see who can correctly guess the meaning of some obscure Victorian slang terms. If that's your thing, check it out. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.